All right, a couple things before we start. Uh, Tiffany's not here. She's having some, her family is having some health care issues. Okay, it's not her, but her family is. So since she has not taken the test yet, uh, I have not graded the test yet, so I hope to be able to give it back to you tomorrow. We'll see how it works. All right. Uh, second thing, I think I said today, but by tomorrow, by the end of class, please have the second set of assignments in, so the, the stuff we did for chapters through chapter 9. All right. We're going to go over chapter 10 right now. After we get done with chapter 10, we're going to go and write uh, a payroll program that has inheritance. And in a lot of ways, we're going to almost start from scratch. All right, talk about what we need, et cetera. You're going to see a bunch of new terms, terminology, et cetera. So the hope is that between, and it, we may not even get it done today. There's a good chance we won't. And if we don't, that's fine. If we do, that's fine. Let's assume we don't. Then tomorrow, when we start class, we'll finish that up, and then we're going to go into Chapter 11, which is on exceptions. Then we'll take the same program that we're working on, we'll be working on today, and we'll add exception handling to it. All right? And uh, we'll, we'll just see where we are by the end of the week. All right? My plan is that, um, in fact, I even updated this. I don't think Rankin likes it when I do this, but I did it anyway. Um, and that is, by and by, I don't know what the heck is happening here. It keeps logging me out. Let me know. Uh, so I've cut down on the amount of assignments, etc., that you have. We've already had the first hands-on test. You've already done the first set of assignments. You've already taken the second test. All right. So by tomorrow, again, the second set of assignments, chapters 6 through 9, have those turned into me, please. And the next set of assignments will be the, you know, even if it's just one program, I don't care, but it's going to be the stuff for chapters 10 and 11. All right? And um, then, <clears throat> at least in an ideal world, we'll go through 12 and 13 next week, and then a week from Monday, we'll have our last test, and that'll be on everything from 9 through 13, all right? And maybe, you know, I, I'm not planning on testing you on any of the other stuff that's in there. We're going to go over some of it, but I'm not going to test you on it. Then, you know, right around, so I, I, it's a little longer than I thought it would be, but somewhere right around the 6th of February, maybe it'll be earlier, we'll see. We'll start on the uh, Android stuff then, all right, just so you have an idea of uh, where we are, where we're going, etc. So... Chapter 10 is on inheritance. You can see in here, I think you all know what inheritance is, and when most people think of inheritance, they think of genetic inheritance. And really, inheritance in, in object-oriented programming isn't that different, except unlike genetic inheritance, you know, I, I'll always remember this, um, this friend of mine named Paul, I won't even say his last name, but Paul and Anne Marie, they were very nice, two of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. He was a, the, uh, a guy who had had acne problems, so it was a good thing he was able to grow a really heavy beard. And they had a baby, and the baby was just gorgeous. And I remember so many people saying, wow, I wonder if they adopted that baby. You know, because typically when you have two people who are not maybe the nicest looking people in the world who get together and have a baby... People think, well, there's no way that can be their child, which isn't a good thing to think, but that's how people think. Just like, and I've said this to you before, typically, if you've got a man and a woman who get married, and t again, typically, if they both have big noses and they have a baby, the baby will have a big nose. That's usually the way it works. Not always, but usually that's how it works. All right? So what can the baby do about it? Well, the baby, you can have a nose job, I guess, when it gets, when it gets older, or it can live with it. There really aren't... Too many things that it can do. It's not like you can take and take the old nose off and put on the one you want. But that is what you can do with code inheritance. All right, and you'll see that as we go on in here. So we've talked about overloading. Now we're going to talk about overriding. All right, we'll get into that in just a bit. I've talked to you before about public and private. Now we're going to look at protected. All right. We'll look at the chains of inheritance. We'll get to that in just a minute. 
back back in the day, and I don't know if they even talk about it anymore, but back in the day when I used to teach DOS, the disk operating system, and you talked about what was at the top of the hierarchy, you talked about the root folder. All right, everything was up at the root. That was the top. Well, in Java, it's the object class. Everything in Java inherits directly or indirectly from the object class. All right. We'll also talk about polymorphism. You are going to actually create abstract classes and abstract methods in the next assignment. You are going to create an interface. We will talk about anonymous classes, so I want you to see them. And I think we'll use anonymous classes when we do the GUI stuff in here. The functional interfaces in Lambda, I'm not sure if we're going to do anything with that, but we'll look at it. It's just the last page or two, the last slide or two that's in here. All right. So the author talks about the fact that when you talk about life, life is a series of inheritances, all right? And the, he talks about generalization versus specialization. And he said, if you look at insects, that's a general class. If you look at bumblebees, that's a specific class. It's the same kind of thing when you look at mammals. That's pretty generic. And even dogs underneath mammals is pretty generic. All right, but when you start breaking them down to Beagle and Bass and Hound and Great Dane, et cetera, that's more specialized. That's what we're talking about here. So what we're going to build is something that's sort of like this, except we're going to have payroll right here. And then under payroll, we'll have four of these boxes. All right, we will have payroll. Then we will have hourly, commission, salary, and piece worker. So we'll have those four classes underneath. This right here, and it's the same kind of thing we're building, it's called a level two class hierarchy. This is level zero and that's level one. But since there are two levels, we call that a level two hierarchy. All right? What you can do then when you start to work on this is if you look up on the top, this insect class, if you look at the picture, that class will be what is referred to as an abstract class. It is so generic in nature that you would never create, oh, you know, wow, I just got stung by what? An insect. That's not really, there's not enough information in there, okay, to really help you very much, okay? And there's a big difference between having a grasshopper land on you and having a bumblebee land on you. All right, especially for like my mother, and maybe some of you are like that. My mom's, my mom could die from getting a bee sting. All right, you know, and, and different people are like that. I don't even know if grasshoppers bite. I have absolutely no idea. As of right now, I don't care. But the point is, in the abstract class, you define everything up here that all the classes below could have. And then the classes below, for instance, not all insects have a, I'm sorry, not all insects have a stinger. Okay, not to my knowledge at least, but bumblebees do. So we could add stinger and the ability to sting type of thing. We could add that to a bumblebee. All right? Yes? Um, so would a driver be different from that? Or where no, this isn't a driver. No, the driver is where you set up your main and you basically call everything. That's all that the driver is. No, we'll still have a driver. When we do this, when we do this next assignment, we're going to have an interface file, which we haven't talked about yet. Then we'll create the payroll class, which will be abstract. Then we'll do the hourly class, because it's very similar to what we've already done. Then we'll do the commission class. Then we'll do the salaried class. Then we'll do the piece worker class. Then we will do the driver. So we're actually going to have seven files in what we work on next. All right? When you talk about inheritance, inheritance is what's known as an is-a relationship. All right? So, for instance, a grasshopper is a or is an type of an idea insect. All right? A dog is a mammal. Okay? A, and, and sometimes these things, when you look at them in here, they're, they're, they can be both children and parents. For instance, if there was a... Let's, let's assume for a second there's different kinds of bumblebees. We could have another layer under here. And then bumblebee would be a parent of what's down here and a child of insect. That's totally legit. So, as it says there, a specialized object has all of the characteristics of its parent 
and it's going to have additional things. As the author says there, it makes it special. Well, if, if, if all bumblebees, you know, it, it, this, this relationship, all bumblebees are insects, all grasshoppers are insects, but not all insects are bumblebees. Not all insects are grasshoppers. So the relationship goes upward from parent to child, all right, but not all parents are the same as their children. Now, when you look at this, this right here, insect in this case, is usually referred to as a parent class, all right? And it's a parent, and this is a child class. It goes by other names. Sometimes this is called a base class, and the ones below it are called derived classes, all right? It goes by other names, too. Just typically parent-child or base-derived. There are some, some of them are more derogatory almost in nature, we talk about the way things were in history and whatever. So that, those are the ones that we'll care about. All right? It's also known as a superclass. So insect is a superclass of bumblebee. Bumblebee is a subclass of insect type of an idea. So as it says, the subclass inherits the fields and the methods from the superclass without anything being overridden. If that doesn't make sense, you'll have to kind of wait when we start to key in the code in a little bit, and then hopefully it will. I want to take it really slow when we, when we go through this, and I want to take it really slow when we write this. To me, if, if you get done with this and you go, you know what, maybe I don't understand it fully, but at least conceptually, I get totally what's going on here, that's good. All right? When you do your next test... You will have to do something where you'll be creating a class and then creating subclasses underneath it, all right? So in Java, when you want one class to extend another class, you use the word extends. So if you look at that, what's on the screen here, what this means is graded activity is apparent to final exam. In other words, a final exam is a type of graded activity activity. So graded activity would be the parent or the base class, all right? And final exam would be the child or the derived class. Does that make sense to people? All right. Now they show here how it's going to look. That's not that important. We're not working with UML, all right? Now you know about a lot of this stuff. We have created classes already where we have taken our instance fields and mark them private. All right? Now, I don't like the way that the author mentioned or put this here, and it's not that he's wrong, but he says members of the superclass that are marked private are not inherited by the subclass. That's true. They are indirectly inherited because they may be accessed by the public methods of the superclass. What we have done so far, I'm just telling you this, is in virtually every payroll program that we've created so far, other not just main, but in virtually every single um, method that we've created, we've made them public. And if you've ever done this, if you've ever gone and brought up your code, you know, and up here in uh, in IntelliJ IDEA, and if you bring up something and you look up in the upper right hand corner, you might notice a bunch of gold stuff along the sides. And a lot of times what it's going to tell you is it, you're going to have warnings. And it'll tell you, well, this class could be private. All right? And that is true. I, I'm purposely having us make it public, but it would be totally possible for it to be private. The reason I'm telling you that is the stuff that we're going to work on now, this stuff, all right, you'll want to make sure that anything you want to be able to share is indeed public. All right? Public methods, private data. And I mentioned to you, right when we started talking about, um, when we started talking about object-oriented programming, I said, in a nutshell, what it is, is it's using public methods to manipulate private data. Again, that's a generalization because you can't have public data, although you never should. You can't have private methods. All right? Members of the superclass that are marked public are inherited directly by the subclass and may be 
directly accessed from the subclass. But there's a new thing that we're going to get to in just a bit. You know what public is. We've talked, kind of talked about it actually pretty much. I think you know what private is. We've talked about that pretty much. There's also something called protected, which is in between public and private, where public is accessible to everybody and private is only accessible in the class that you're in. Protected is accessible in the class you're in and in any descendants of the class that you're in. So it's like if you imagine if, if I took some, let's say, a piece of data and I made it protected, then I could, I, I could have access to it and change it. So could my kids, so could their kids, so could their kids, etc. That's what we're talking about with protected. All right. As it says, when an instance of a subclass is created, non-private methods are available through the subclass object. So in other words, okay, not only not only can, if we look back up here, what does a final exam have? Okay, a final exam is a type of graded activity. What does a graded activity have? A get score and a get grade. Everybody see this up on the picture here? That means that since these are public with the plus signs, that means that the stuff that's in here, final exam has total access to get grade, get score, and set score because they are all public. So it is setting that private data using those public methods. And that's what the author is showing here. Set score, even though it's here, final exam, the child is, is using it. Totally legit. It's not read there because it's an error. It's read because the author is having, trying to have that stick out so you can see what he's talking about. <clears throat> All right. Now, notice a couple things. Constructors are not inherited. When a class, subclass is instantiated, the superclass constructor is executed first. That might sound a little confusing, but look at it this way. <clears throat> Again, we, we mentioned this before, a picture that they saw, insect. And then down below that, we had, among, among other things, we had bumblebee. So what I'm saying is, if insect has a constructor, and Bumblebee has a constructor, the first thing that happens is, before that constructor can be set, it has to call that constructor. All right? And it actually, if you remember one of the words for this, this, this is a superclass of this, right? So insect is a superclass of Bumblebee. One, the way that you can call it is you can say super. All right? And there'll be a little bit more to it than that, but you use the keyword super to work with the superclass. All right, so as the author says there, super refers to the object's superclass. All right, and you're going to see examples of it as we go on, okay? All right. It says, if a parameterized constructor is defined in the superclass, you must provide a no arc constructor. Or the subclass must provide a constructor and must call the superclass a constructor. It doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense until you see it in action. If you call the superclass, it must be the first line of code in there. So the only thing, that, you know, if this, is, if this is the Bumblebee class and you're going to call that constructor, that's got to be the first executable line of code in there. You can have blank lines, comments before it, but no other executable code. And think about this. All right, let's just change this for a second. And let's suppose... because this is the kind of thing that we're going to set up in just a minute. So let's say this is payroll. And we say that every person in payroll has a first name, has a last name, and has a social security number. Let's just keep it there, all right? And then we've got hourly, I'll just make two of these. And let's say that we've got salary, all right? Well, there's no sense in me redefining first name, last name, or social security number in either of those, I've already got it up here. So if, if I've got a constructor under hourly where I have to set the first name, the last name, the social security number, the hours worked, and the hourly rate, these three things are going to be set 
via a called a super right there. And again, if it doesn't make sense, you're going to be doing it in just a couple minutes. All right, so if we go through it and it still doesn't make sense, please, by all means, ask. All right, a subclass may have a method with the same name as the superclass. As an example, if you look up on the screen here, we're going to, we're, in our superclass, we're going to make a method called earnings. We could have called it gross pay. It really doesn't matter. All right, but that's going to be an empty method in here because the way that an hourly person gets earnings is different than the way a salaried person gets earnings. So we're going to create it here and we're going to override it there. We've looked at overloading already where you have two methods with the same name but they have different um, parameter lists. Now we're going to override where a child class changes a method that was defined in a parent class. When you do this, you cannot change what goes in the parentheses. Did you hear what I said? When you override, you cannot change what's in the parentheses. When you overload, you must change what's in the parentheses. All right, because people always ask, well, that's confusing. What's the difference between them? That's the biggest difference, what I just gave you. <clears throat> so here's an example. Now they had that graded activity. Now they're having a curved activity. So if you look in here, what they're saying is, look, to set the score, to set the score for a curved activity is different than the way you do it for a graded activity. So I give a test. Everybody fails. And I'm like, well, I've got to either give you give you a retest or do like I do and give you a chance to earn some more points or I curve it. But if I curve it, the way that I figure out the score is different than a typical graded activity. All right, so we are overriding the set score method that's in there. So it can do things, a curved activity can do things that a great typical graded activity cannot do. All right, this is just the same stuff that I told you before. This at override, as it says, should be used before this. So if you're going to override a method, you should put that at the top, at override. And the O in override is an uppercase. I believe that when we do that here, all you're gonna see is the at and the override are gonna get gray looking. All right, but the system will recognize it. Notice it says, this causes the compiler to display an error message if the method fails to correctly override the method in the superclass. All right. Now, what if I'm in here, if you look up on the screen here, what if I'm in here and I've got a set score here and I've got a set score here? Everybody with me? So I've got a set score here. This is the over, I overrided, I, I did an override on this set score with this one. But after I do that, before I do this set score, I want to call this one. So I want the child to call the parent. If I want the child to call the parent, it's super dot. All right, again, going on after super class. And that's what they show right here. So any subclass can still call its parent or its overridden super class method using the super keyword. And the best way to learn this is to just play around with it. You're going to see an example. The example we do, again, is going to be fairly complex. But you're going to see an example of this as we go on. And again, notice the author says there is a distinction between overloading and overriding. You can read the author's words, but it's pretty much what I just told you. We have done overloading. We have not yet done overriding. You are going to be doing that today. All right. <clears throat> Both overloading and overriding, can, you can do both in a relation in, a, in inheritance, but you can only override if you've got an inheritance relationship. All right. Now, we're used to working with the word final, and you've done stuff like static, int, final, num students equal 10, something like that, where the number of students is 10. You know what that is. You can also 
put final on a, on a method. If you put final on a method as they show up on the screen right here, then if you attempt to overload that method, that if you attempt to override that method, not overload, if you attempt to override that method, you get an error. Yes? Is that all final method? It, it, it depends on the context in which it's used. Final basically always means it ends here in one way or another. You can make a class that's final too. If you make a class that's final, then that class can't be extended. It can't be inherited. It's, it's at the end. The actual recommendation from Java is the only thing you should ever make final are constants. You should never have final methods because you never know who might want to override them. You should never make classes final because you never know who might want to override them. All right, so again, we've talked about protected. Protected, again, is sort of in between public and private. All right? So, you know, I've tried giving different definitions and the like of this, and somebody gave me this one a while, or else I read it. I don't remember. But if you imagine that for public, you know, you, somebody tells you something. All right? And um, they tell you, you know, you say, well, is this Public information, yeah, yeah, you can tell it to anybody you want. Maybe it's a secret. So you can tell it to everybody. It doesn't matter if they're friends, family, somebody you see on the street. You can get rid of a billboard. You can do whatever you want. That's public. All right? If somebody says, tells me something, and I say, can I tell anybody? They go, just your family. Just you, your wife, and your three kids, and a dog if you want. But you can't tell anybody else. All right? The net pretty much is private. If, I, if, if they tell me a secret, and they, I say, can I tell anybody? And they go, you can tell your family, and they can tell their family, and they can tell their family, etc. That's protected. All right? Now, to be honest with you, it says here a protected member's access is somewhere between private and public. Protected is another one of those things that actually gets pretty much gets overused. People think, well, I better make this protected and they make things protected, they probably shouldn't make protected. Again, you're going to see some of this as we go on. All right? As it says, using protected instead of private makes some tasks easier. But you may or may not remember one of the things we've talked about in the past is the concept of side effects. All right? The more power you give anything, especially data in the program, the more power you give it, what that means is the more people can potentially change it. All right? And since the more people can potentially change it, the better the chance is that sooner or later it's going to get screwed up. All right? As it says, it's always better to make all fields private and then provide public methods. If you don't give anything, if you don't say public, if you don't say private, then notice you get what's called package access by default. And I think I mentioned this to you. That means that everything that's in the package has access. What the heck does that mean? This is the package, right? Remember before? This is how we've always created that package. All right, so everything underneath there has access to it. But you, as a programmer, you should never do that. You should make stuff public or private or protected. You should never say, well, you know, I can just leave it. The default will be fine. You should leave no doubt. So this is a chart that pretty much goes over the same thing. All right, you'll notice public is the most lenient. Private is the least lenient. A superclass, as it says, can also be derived from other classes. So when you look at this, and I don't mean to go too nuts with it, but pass-fail activity is the parent of pass-fail exam. Graded activity is the grandparent of pass-fail exam. Object is the great-grandparent in this example. Object is a parent somewhere up the hierarchy of everything. Object is a Java class. Most every time you put something down, you could have put object dot. 
if you wanted to. There's no sense in doing that, but quite often you can. Typically, again, when you depict classes, you show them in a class hierarchy. Again, the one that we'll create will say, like I said, payroll, then hourly, salaried, it'll have commission and peace worker. We'll have four different things underneath it. Object class I already mentioned to you. Okay. And since it's part of the java.lang package, and since the java.lang package is automatically brought into each and every program, you don't have to do anything with it. <clears throat> Notice that's where two string is even uh, defined, and we've already seen how to override two string. All right. One of the hardest terms to understand is polymorphism. You may or may not have heard the term before. It's a Greek word that means many forms. So the idea, I've already shown it to you, believe it or not. I said if I define earnings up here in the payroll class, the way that you do earnings here is you do hours worked and hourly rate, right? And if you have to, you give overtime. Here, it's probably just going to be a salary. You know, we're salaried here. It doesn't matter if I'm here and I decide I'm going to, you know, stay until 10 o'clock every night. If I do that, I don't get any more money for doing that. Whereas if I was hourly and I was on the clock, I would get more money for doing it. All right. They're both earnings, but they're done, the earnings are done in different ways. Well, that is polymorphism. You know, again, the classic example that people use for polymorphism is they, they do put something in here like this, like mammal. All right. Then under mammal, they put dog, and they put cat, and they put bird. And they define some stuff in mammal, and one thing they define is a method called speak. That means if I make that public method, the dog can speak, a cat can speak, and a bird can speak. But I have to override each one of those, because you wouldn't want the dog to say tweet, tweet type of an idea. All right? So when you're doing polymorphism, basically what you're saying is you can have different objects can use the same method, but they know how to call the right version of that method based on the type of object they are. I don't know how to put it any plainer than that. <clears throat> As it says, the term polymorphism means the ability to take many forms. In Java, a reference variable is polymorphic because it can reference objects of types different from its own as long as they are subclasses of the same type. All right? <clears throat> and this is a little bit hard sometimes for people to understand. Again, if we look here, notice we've got graded activity. And there's three kinds of graded activities. There is a final exam graded activity. There is a pass-fail graded activity. There is a pass-fail exam graded activity. So it looks a little confusing, but I can do this. Notice... On the left-hand side, all of them say graded activity, but on the right-hand side of the equal sign, they're all different types. All right, The system knows how to work with it based on what you're doing in here. And if you go, that's confusing, then why do this? The author is just showing you that you can do it. All right, Not so much that you should do it. We're not going to do anything like that. Polymorphism uses dynamic binding. We've talked about this before. The reason that this works, that, they all, that the dog and the cat and the bird all know how to speak correctly, is that stuff, when it's, when it's dynamic, dynamically binded, it's all set at runtime. So while the program's running, the, the program can say, oh, you're a dog. If you're going to speak, you're going to bark or woof or whatever. <clears throat> and the opposite of dynamic binding is early binding, when it's done at compile time. All right, we are going to go in, our payroll class will be called an abstract class. Just like up here, that animal or mammal would be an abstract class. And if you look on the screen here, dog and cat and bird, they'd probably be abstract classes too. 
So I come down here and now I could say things like beagle. All right, I can come down to cat and say like calico. I can go down to bird and I can say like parrot. So what I'm telling you is now we're down 0, 1, 2, we're down to a three level hierarchy, but the first two levels, level 0 and level 1, these classes would all be abstract. They're too generic. You can't sit there and make a dog object. What kind of dog? That's, that's why you go down here. That's exactly what they're saying. When you make an abstract class, if you look up on the screen, you've got to have the word abstract before the word class. All right? <clears throat> an abstract method, and we're going to make one, has no body. We're going to make an abstract method up here. It's going to be called earnings. And that's almost what it's going to look like. It'll be like public void earnings, uh, paren paren, semicolon. Again, you're going to see that in just a bit. So if you have an abstract method that appears in a superclass, it must be overridden in the subclass. All right? Abstract methods, ab I'm sorry, abstract class classes can have abstract methods and they can have non-abstract methods. Typically they have more abstract methods. We're also going to create an interface. That's the first thing we're going to do after the break, is we're going to create an interface. What we're going to do is we're going to take all of the, um, there's, I don't know, about 20 or so constants we're going to have in this program. We'll have a bunch of constants for hourly workers. We'll have a bunch of constants for salaried workers, we'll have a bunch of constants for commission workers, and we'll have a bunch of constants for peace workers. And rather than have to, to, to declare those in the driver file and in the class file, we'll put them into an interface. Okay? And when you use an interface, it's got a uh, .java extension, but you can't create classes based off of an interface. All right, it's kind of a holder for lack of better words. And again, you're going to see it in just a bit. It says it is often said that an interface is like a contract. When the class implements the interface, it must adhere to the contract. That's the way I've even defined an API or an application programming, an API application programming interface. All right. Now. When you work with interfaces in classes, we just mentioned this a couple minutes ago, when you do inheritance, it extends. When you do an interface, it implements. You're going to see all this stuff as we go on. All right? So if you look at this, imagine here what I got in blue right there. Any class, like the one shown here, this is class final exam three, any class can extend zero or only one other class. So every class can have at most one direct parent. I'm going to say that one more time. Any class can have at most one direct parent. All right? But any class can implement as many interfaces as you need to implement. In fact, I think the author even shows it here. There. So there, we're, we don't even have any inheritance, but we're implementing three interfaces. That's totally fine to do. All right. Again, typically, what you put in there are things like constants. That's all we're going to use in our interface. It's just we're going to put in, like I said, about 20 or so constants. <clears throat> So any class that implements that interface has direct access to those variables, or in our case, to those constants. Again, a class can be derived from only one superclass, but it can have zero, one, or more interfaces. All right. Beginning in Java 8, as it says, interfaces may have default methods. A default method is an interface method that has a body. I've never even made one of these. Okay. 
All right. Anonymous inner classes. Every class that we've created so far, would you all agree with this? Every class that we've created so far has been public. Would everybody agree with that? Every class. And every class that we've created so far, the public class, the name you give that class is the exact same name as the Java file. Would you agree with that? It is totally legal in Java to have private classes inside of your public class. When you do that, those are called anonymous inner classes because you don't give them a name. And I think this, yep, that's the last thing that's in here, the last slide. A functional interface is an interface that has one abstract method, okay? And a lambda expression can be used to create an object that implements an interface and overrides its abstract method. These are fairly complex topics, all right? And unfortunately, the book we have doesn't really go into them in much depth or breadth of coverage at all. If you want more, I would say just Google Java lambdas. Most, I mean, JavaScript supports lambdas. Most programming languages support lambdas in one form or another. What they can do is they can result in you writing a lot less code, okay, among other things. All right, so before we go on the break, which we're going to take in just a minute, all right, I don't know, again, if yours has been set up like mine, but if you look here, <clears throat> I've got a bunch of these payrolls. We did payroll 01. We did payroll 02. We did payroll 03. Oh, that's 2B. We did 3A and not, no 3B. All right, but this 3A, I'm not even sure what that is. That's not today good. All right. So I'm not sure where we are, but I think we're on number four. I don't even know. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to go and use this payroll 04A example. All right, I'm going to create that. And then I'm going to start up a new project in, in IntelliJ IDEA. So the one I've got, now I'm going to save it. I'm going to close it, and I'm going to start up a new one. Create new project. You know this. It's been a while, but we've done this. Next. Next, I'm going to give it the path. Again, mine is payroll 04A. Finish. We're going to do two things, and then we're going to take a break. All right? First thing we're going to do is, if you would please come up to your, your source folder like we've always done. Right mouse click on the source folder. Choose new Java class. Don't, don't type payroll. We're going to change it up a little bit. Is everybody right here? All right. Click the down arrow by class. Change it to interface. All right. And we're going to put here edu.rankin. You know, you're, you're, not, you're not JP Scott. Dot, instead of payroll, interface files typically start with a capital I. So our interface file is going to be I payroll with a big I and a big P. All right, so edu.rankin, please do this, all right, dot JP Scott or whatever yours is, dot ipayroll. All right. After you've done that, click the OK button. <clears throat> and that made our package, and it put ipayroll under it. All right. And we'll just do one more thing. We'll be doing more later. But if you look up on the screen, again, right mouse click on the name of your package, choose new. Now we want Java class, so we want it to stay class, and we're going to put in here payroll. So right now, you should have your uh, package name here, and underneath it should be iPayroll and should be payroll. All right, they're both empty as of right now. When we come back from the break, which we will do at about 135, let's make it 138, we will write the interface for the payroll. But again, make sure you're putting the code into public interface iPayroll. All right? So let's take a break. Let's just make it 140. All right? <clears throat>